chapter number 16 and verse 29. 1 Kings 16 and verse number 29. 1 Kings 16, 29. In the thirty and eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab the son of Omri to reign over Israel. And Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel and Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Now watch this subscript. In his days did Heel, the Bethlite, Build Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof in Abiram, his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof in his youngest son, Sigub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. Father, bless your word now. In thy name I pray. Amen. In verse number 34, it gives you the times. In plainer words, it's giving you the atmosphere, the spiritual condition of the people. For Jericho was a cursed city. God had placed a curse on, a curse on it. And you know what happened at Jericho. You know what happened to the, the, the goodly Babylonian garment, the wedge of gold and so forth. How that uh, a man was stoned to death and his family for taking that from the tent and burying it in his tent and, and, and hiding it. And so God placed a curse up on that town. So the time of Ahab was a time of apostasy, horrible apostasy. He married a pagan, idolatrous Baal worshiper, and her name was Jezebel. Now there's two names in the Bible that you never find people naming their children. Men never named their boys Judas, and the women never named their girl Jezebel. (laughs) But no doubt a lot of people have been called Jezebel (laughs) and Judas under different circumstances. That's right. Because that's a name that is associated with condemnation, corruption, and as bad as it gets. So if you hear somebody call a woman Jezebel, (laughs) you know exactly what they've got in mind. Or Judas, the betrayer. So we have Ahab, the king of Israel, marrying a Baal worshiper. Now what happens here is the relationship between Ahab and Jezebel is the kind of relationship where she dominates him. She dominates him entirely. She dictates to Ahab every move to make. He's a very weak, vacillating king. He's not a leader in any sense of the word. He's a whining, uh, he's a whining uh, opportunist that wants what he wants and if he doesn't get it he acts like a child. In the case of Naboth's vineyard which was hard the Bible said hard pressed in other words right next to his property he wanted his vineyard and when he couldn't buy his vineyard then by the counsel of his wife he brought charges against Naboth and had him brought up and had him stoned to death and so by doing that he took what belonged to another man God's a merciful God. He puts up with a lot. He goes along with people to a certain point. And then when they cross a certain line, he says enough. And that was the line. That was the line. When he had Naboth stoned to death and took his vineyard, then that was, God was finished. That was it. He crossed the line. Now I think that applies today. I believe the Lord puts up with a lot from us sometimes when we're in a backslidden, cold, indifferent situation. And uh, he's merciful, a long-suffering God. Thank God for that. Long-suffering. Not willing that any should perish. But his sweet Holy Spirit warns and warns and warns. And then there's a line out there somewhere. And when you cross that line, 
That's called the sin unto death if you're a saved person. And it's called the unpardonable sin if you're unsaved. You cross that line. And when that happens, then there's not anything can be done by a human being to change it. It's just going to happen. So when he took, a, when he took Jezebel into his family, took her to become his wife, uh, the fruit of that relationship we'll talk about in a minute, it was not good. It produced nothing but bad. So the marriage, when you marry somebody, it's a big deal. It's bigger than buying a car. It's bigger than buying a house, right? It's even bigger than where you work. It's a big deal who you marry. Big deal. So what do you do, preacher, if you've made a mistake and you're married to somebody and you made a mistake? Make it work. That's what you do. You make it work. I don't know how many young couples I've told, they came in there and said, well, you know, I could tell. You could tell by talking to them. Well, he just doesn't love me anymore. I don't love him anymore. And, or, he, you know, we just don't love each other. And, and, and there's nothing in the Bible that says you have to love each other when you get married. Did you know that? From Genesis to Revelation, it's not found one time in the Bible. What you do find in there is when Paul told, uh, when he told uh, the believers at Ephesus, he said, love your wives. After you're married to them, here you are. You love that wife. You ought to love her when you marry her. You ought to love her. You certainly should. Or him. You certainly should. There ought to be love involved in it. But if you read anything about culture, go back through the ages, folks. You'll find out there have been prearranged marriages all over this world for, for thousands of years where love had nothing to do with it. It was a prearranged marriage. And that's what had happened. That's the way it was. So all the romance and all that that you find in American culture has been lacking in a lot of places. So I don't know if Ahab loved Jezebel. I don't know what brought them together. I have no idea why he chose someone like that. Uh, but uh, after he married her, he found out what he got, I'm sure. And it was not a good union. Nothing but sorrow and heartache came from that union. Death and destruction. For Jezebel was a, was a headstrong woman. She was a conniving woman. She was the kind of woman that had, she wanted her way. And whatever she had to do to get her way, she would get it. She would do it. Now, people are still like that, folks. Women are still like that. Not all women, but there are women like that. Headstrong. You know, were you, were you, you've, heard this, you've heard the old axiom, they wear the pants in the family. Well, I haven't heard that in a long time. But that's, that was simply meaning, well, he, she is the he of the home. She makes the decisions. Well, the Bible says in the book of Genesis that the desire of the woman shall be to her husband. The normal desire of a woman will be like that. That's what the Bible says. So that's the way it ought to be. And the model marriage, the model marriage should be that the man takes responsibility in the home and does what he ought to do. And he should become the spiritual head of that house and take responsibility for the spiritual condition of their children. He's the one that should shoulder the responsibility for paying the bills. He shoulders the responsibility to see the home is put together and kept together. That's the man's responsibility. I don't care what political correctness has to say about it. They've already destroyed this nation. Over 50% of our marriages are ending in divorce. You, the last place you want to look for counsel on a marriage is out there. Amen. You come before the Lord, you have problems in your marriage, you have differences, you have things that you can't work out. Bring them to God. Get on your knees and talk to the Lord as husband and wife. And you'll be surprised at how God can intervene in a marriage and soften her heart and strengthen your heart. Men. <laughs> and change that situation. But in any event, we're looking back at, a, back at a marriage here that's nothing like marriage is today. Because if you'll remember, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. David had wives and concubines. All these things are different from our culture today. There's nothing in American culture that you can use to compare that with. So as far as Ahab coming home to a wife, you know, and she had supper ready and all this and so forth and so on, it didn't work like that. But she was a headstrong woman and he was a weak, vacillating man. So therefore, she became the dominant factor in that home. And she became the leader in that home. 
and she was the one who dictated to him what to do, and he would whine when he did not get his way. And then when he whined, she reminded him, you are the king, aren't you? You are a king, and you can pass to make decrees, and you can do certain things. And so he did. In 1 Kings chapter 21 and verse number 25, though, here's where his greatest weakness is found. The Bible said in 1 Kings 21, 25, But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. She saw the weakness. She saw his lack of faith. She knew that. She had that discerning spirit, and she inflamed it. She stirred it up. But the Bible said he sold himself to work wickedness. In plain words, he lived for his pleasure and immediate gratification, and he became a slave to it. And when a man lives like that, I don't care what, who he is, that man's a slave, and that man is incapable of leadership. If he's a senator, a president, if he's a mayor, whatever he is, when he lives for immediate gratification, for the pleasures of his flesh, and that's exactly what this is talking about, he has sold himself and they own him. His flesh owns him. He's a slave to his, uh, to his feelings and to his, uh, to his pleasures and to his vices. And believe me, they will be added more to the other. Jezebel was a Phoenician idol worshiper. She at one time had 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the grove. The grove, to just be surf, skim the surface with it a little bit tonight, the grove was a religious place dedicated to pleasure as it related to worship to their God. And they had temple prostitutes that were part of the religious ceremony. Now you can put the rest of it together. That's what it was. It was a licentious thing, <coughs> filthy. Can you imagine how the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob looked down upon this when Ahab brought that into Samaria? I've been to Samaria. And I was impressed, to use the word in the right sense, by the structure that I saw. I stood at the ruins of the palace of Ahab. And I looked down the hill below, and I asked the guide, I said, where's Naboth's vineyard? <laughs> That's the first thing that came to my mind, because his vineyard touched right up next to the, to the Samaria, which is the capital of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the northern ten tribes of Israel. I said, where was Naboth's vineyard? He pointed a place out to me. I guess it was right. I, don't, I have no way of knowing. But I do know this. I do know that it was a magnificent, it was one of the biggest structures of all of Israel that I went to. And it's in the north, of course. It's the capital of the ten northern tribes. To give you just a little bit of history, you remember that the ten tribes separated, went to the north, two stayed in the south. The capital of the southern two tribes was Jerusalem. Never changed. Still is, as a matter of fact. <laughs> To the north, ten tribes separated under Jeroboam, and there, uh, uh, or was it Rehoboam? I forget which one. Rehoboam? Jeroboam. Jeroboam. That's right. Jeroboam. I was right. Rehoboam was, was the son of Solomon. Under Rehoboam, ten tribes went to the north, and their capital was Samaria. Samaria. And the capital then, of course, you've got two Israel broken in two, Jerusalem one capital, Samaria the other. And Samaria was quite a thing. It really was. I thought to myself when I looked at that years ago, I thought this man had everything. He had everything. He had this magnificent castle on top of this hill, the hill of Omri it's called. And here he is on top of this magnificent hill, this capital, and he could see everything. I mean it was strategically located to where the king in his castle could see any opposing force that might be coming from any direction. He's up on this hill. So it's a fortified thing. And so here's Ahab and his castle on top of this hill. And he wasn't satisfied till he had that little vineyard that belonged to one of his little, to uh, one of his servants, uh, Naboth. He wasn't satisfied. It just shows you folks that stuff never satisfies. Okay, how much you got? You got to have more. You got to have more. And Naboth wouldn't sell it to him because it was his inheritance. It was his inheritance. It was his family's inheritance to be handed down from generation to generation. But Jezebel, of course, schemed to do it. And why did she do that? Because of what she was. Now, somebody could say, well, a preacher, I'll guarantee you right now she's not dead because I'm married to her. <laughs> Yeah, and I asked her, she'd probably say she's married to Ahab, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
But in any event, uh, we've got a situation here where we have lust, greed, and abuse of power. Uh, have you seen any of that lately? <laughs> uh, Jezebel was the kind of person who had, had, had to get back. She had, a, she had vengeance. She wanted vengeance. She wanted retribution. If you remember when Elijah the prophet confronted the, the prophets of Baal on top of Carmel, you know what happened. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob manifested his glory, and he, and he, and he showed without question who God was. Well, it made Jezebel mad. It made her mad. And she sent out a, she sent out a warning. I'm going to get you, Elijah. I'm going to do to you what you've done to my prophets. And, uh, of course, Elijah uh, strengthened himself in the Lord and marched right into her castle and stood right before her and said, All right, we're going to see what you're going to do. Uh, what did he do? He took off. <laughs> he took off. Away he went. It just shows you God uses fallible people because Elijah is a great prophet. He is. Remember, I will send you who the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord? Who was it that showed up at the top of the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses? Elijah. Just remember that, folks. Remember that when Satan begins to beat you to death because you don't reach some standard of perfection that he's laid before you, remember, it's the grace of God. It's what Christ can do in you that, has a, that bears on our relationship with the Lord. That's what it's all about. And Christ did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Amen. But Elijah was a man. The Bible says in the book of James, he was a man of like passions as we are. Like us. This is one of the reasons I believe the Bible. These are real people. These aren't Greek gods, you know, all that junk you get. These are real people. I've been to Carmel. And when you get to the top of Mount Carmel, they've got a huge uh, uh, stone uh, monument erected to Elijah. And you can look down below Carmel. You can look off and look down below. And there's the, and there is the, and there's the spring down there where they got the water. They, so the guide said, down there is where they got the water to carry up and pour on, that, uh, pour on that altar on top of Carmel. So there it is. You go over there, folks. If you ever have an opportunity to go to the Holy Land, you're going to go from one place to the next place to the next place to the next place, and here they are, one right after another that you've read about in the Bible. There they are, just like the Bible says. There they are. But the thing about going is that once you go and once you see these things, it'll fix it in your mind forever what it looks like. I know what the Sea of Galilee looks like. I know what Capernaum looks like. I know what it looks like to stand at Capernaum and look over to the Sea of Galilee. I know what it is to stand at Nazareth and stand at, the, at that hill in Nazareth where they were going to throw him down and kill him. Remember? You can stand at Nazareth where he grew up as a boy and you can look out into a valley that drops and you can see from one city to the next miles away. Cities. There's no place I've ever been like that. Here's one little town over here. Here's another little town over there. And you can look across that valley and that's the valley of Megiddo. So as a boy the Lord Jesus Christ could stand at Nazareth and look down into the valley where the final battle would be fought at the second advent. Before he could come into that valley on a white horse he has to go to the cross and die. But he will come into that valley. Make no mistake about it. The valley of decision. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. So Elijah uh, encountered the wrath of Jezebel. She was, a, uh, she was a murderous type woman. She would kill you in a heartbeat if you got in her way. After Ahab died, she lived another 14 years as the queen mother. She had children. One of them was a daughter named Athaliah. Athaliah. Turn over here to 2 Chronicles chapter 21, verse number 5. Second Chronicles chapter 21 and verse number 
Second Chronicles 21 5. Jehoram was 32 years old when he began to reign. He reigned eight years in Jerusalem. He walked in the way of the kings of Israel, like as did the house of Ahab, for he had the daughter of Ahab to wife. You hear this? He had the daughter of Ahab to wife. And he did, and he wrought that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord. So he comes in the same relationship to his wife as Ahab did, because he had the daughter of Ahab to wife. Howbeit the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David, and as he promised to give a light to him and to his sons forever. Now you continue reading on with that, but look at verse number, uh, 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 verse number 18. Let's see now. Turn, turn, to, turn to 2 Kings chapter number 11 <coughs> and verse number 1. 2 Kings 11, 1. This is the daughter of Jezebel and Ahab. And here is an indication of her character. And when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. She killed every one of them. But in verse number two, Jehosheba, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, in other words, his aunt, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons, which were slain, and they hid him even him and his nurse in the bedchamber from Athaliah so that he was not slain. And he was hid with her in the house of the Lord six years, and Athaliah did reign over the land. <coughs> she was just like her mother. Athal Athaliah was just like Jezebel. Now, you don't hear much at all about Athaliah because Jezebel is so famous in the sense that she was uh, Ahab's wife. But Ath Athaliah was a wicked, headstrong, murderous woman, just like her mother. Have you ever heard the term like mother, like daughter? You say, well now, do you believe then that certain characteristics can be passed down through the genes? Yes, they can. They certainly can. But what can change that? The grace of God. The grace of God. The grace of God. But certain characteristics absolutely can be passed down from generation to generation. You find it in the Bible over and over and over again. How did Jezebel come to her end? Anybody remember? Jehu, Jehu was the instrument in the hands of God to exercise judgment. And uh, the king of Israel and the king of uh, Judah had gone out to meet him, find out what he was coming for. And both of them wound up, one wound up dead and the other one shot and he wound up dead later. And Jehu continued to drive furiously, the Bible says. And then he came to the house or building or whatever it was where Jezebel was located. She saw him coming. She was, she was not one to be taken uh, uh, unawares. She, uh, wicked people are always wonder, <laughs> wondering what's behind the door, you know, what's, what's happening. So she was watching over her shoulder, in other words, all the time. She saw him coming. She had sent these as, she had sent riders out on horseback to find out why he was coming. What was this about? Was he coming in peace or what? And the riders that she sent out stayed with him. So what happened was eventually he came and she stuck herself out the window. She'd painted her face and fixed her hair and prepared herself for Jehu. And she uh, said, uh, had Zimri peace when he slew his master? In plain words, you're going to come in here. If you come in here with bad intent, what kind of peace do you think you're going to have if you do that? And... Uh, he said, who's on my side? And inside that house, 
uh, a couple of men stuck their head out the window apparently and said, we are. And so they took her and they cast her down from that window to the ground below. And apparently the fall killed her. Jehu got off his horse, walked in the building, sat down to have something to eat, something to drink. He might have walked right across her dead body, I don't know. But he walked in. He sat down at the table. And then he said to someone, go out, take her body, and bury it. She is a king's daughter. And of course the king was Ethbaal of the Phoenicians. Go out and bury her. When they got out there, all they found was a skull, hands, and her feet. I did quite a bit of research into that. I thought, you know, I've heard what that represents, and it's, it's pretty good, but uh, Jameson Fawcett and Brown is a good old-fashioned commentary. It's been around a long time. And next to that text, it says, dogs won't eat the hands or the feet or the head normally of, uh, of a carcass or something. Now, I don't know if that's so or not. I'm not that familiar with, with some, I, just, I try to do a lot of digging into it, and everything I could find on it was that a dog will eat stuff that you don't want to eat. That's why they're dogs. Now, if you've got a good dog, fine. Everybody's got pet dogs. That's all fine. But in the Bible, a dog is never portrayed in a good light. Never. That's not, you know, if you've got a good dog, fine. <laughs> but in the Bible, no. No. <laughs> when you cast something to the dogs, <laughs> It's worthless. What you normally hear is that these hands that had shed innocent blood, this head that had conceived the treachery, and these feet that had carried her to do it was so vile and so wicked that even the dogs wouldn't eat it. And that's fine. I mean, that, that's fine. Uh, that's fine. But uh, that's all that was left the hands, feet, and the head. She came to a very bad end. R.G. Lee's got a message called Payday Someday. He's a Southern Baptist preacher. He preached that message probably 50, 75 years ago. R.G. Lee, I think he pastored down in Memphis, Tennessee in Bellevue Baptist Church, I think. But in any event, the title of the message, Payday Someday. Well, payday for Jezebel was the day that Jehu showed up and she was cast out of that window. And it was God making a statement that there was stuff about Jezebel that not even a dog would eat. She was so filthy and so vile. And she came to her end. He made a, he made a statement about her. Uh, for example, when the king of Judah died, they carried him and made a made a lament over his body and buried him in the tombs of the kings of Judah. They gave him an honorable burial. But in the Old Testament, many times when somebody died that had the curse of God on them, their corpse would just lie on the side of the road and nothing but bones would be left. You got to remember the ancient world, folks. They would crucify people and their dead bodies would hang on a stake or a cross until, the, until all the flesh was gone and the bones just hung there. It was for shock treatment. It was for shock. It was to get a message over. And it wasn't unusual at all for something like that to happen. When Saul died and Jonathan died on the battlefield, you remember, anybody remember what they did with them? At Beth Shon, they carried their bodies and tied them up. Here's the body of the king of Israel hanging from a, from, a, from a wall. You know, that's a, that's a very uh, embarrassing thing. So when the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, He spent six hours on that tree, didn't He? From 9 o'clock in the morning till 3 in the afternoon. That's, that's the time. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon when He said, it is finished, it was, as, it was as dark, you couldn't see the hand before your face, and the earth had already been shaking, 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 shaking a massive earthquake, it is finished, and the lights went out. 
everything went out. But his body only hung on that tree. It was taken down before the, sun, before, before the light had gone, before the evening, because they came and they begged the body of the Lord, and Pontius Pilate let them have it. And they carried his body to the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea and gave him a burial. They buried his body in a virgin tomb that had never been used before, in a garden, a garden tomb. They sealed it. They put a stone in front of it. The, the power of the Roman Empire had been impressed upon that door. This is the seal of the Caesar of Rome. You don't violate the seal. Of course, you can't seal God in or seal God out. His body did not lie dead on the road. It did not lie dead on a pile. It was not dismembered. His body was laid gently in a virgin tomb. And on the third day, he arose from the dead. And in order for the disciples to go in and see where he had lain, they rolled the stone away. The stone had nothing to do with blocking him coming out of that grave. For just a few hours later, the disciples were gathered together inside a room. And the Bible says, he appeared in their midst and the doors were shut and locked. He just came right in, just like he went right through, just like you will in your glorified body. It's the lowest point that you can get on this earth. It's the lowest of the lowest. God wanted you to know there's nothing lower that can happen to a human being in this life than to die like Jezebel. That's it. That's it. You can't, there's nothing worse than that. That's it. There was nothing to bury. <laughs> you die like Jezebel. Athaliah suffered a, a similar fate because her daughter did because they, they killed her. They killed her right there at the temple because she was trying to usurp the place of the queen and they finished her off and did her away. There's a whole lot more involved in it, but I want to read these two scriptures for you tonight and then I'll come to a close. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. It's important who you run with. It's very important, the crowd you choose. Very important. And 2 Corinthians 6, 14 says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Well, there is no communion. And there's no fellowship, not really. You can relate to each other as human beings, but as far as fellowship, the thing that you live for, the love of your life, what you're about, you don't share that with an unsaved man. He doesn't have that. He, can't, he doesn't know what you're talking about. As far as the things that generally apply to humanity, the hurt and the pain and so forth that has to do with life and problems of life, sure, you can, you can share that. But you need to ask for discernment from God. Ask God to give you the discernment to know what fellowship you can have with the unsaved. Be very careful. Be very careful. Your intention may be good. You may want to win them to the Lord, and that's admirable. That's good. But be careful they don't win you. <coughs> be very careful that they don't win you. Ahab was in bad shape before he ever got Jezebel. But once he got her, buddy, it was on down. It increased. The spiral went downward and accelerated. And I watch that happen to people. Be very, very careful who you pick as friends. Be very careful. And very careful. Because if you get with the wrong one, it'll destroy your life. I had a friend in high school about destroyed me. And I was a stupid fool forever running with him. I was playing basketball at rural high school, making, making fairly good grades. You know, never, I never considered myself a scholar or anything like that, but I got, a lot, I got by, no problem. And uh, then this one guy, this one guy got with him, started laying out of school, going down on the railroad tracks, getting a bottle of wine, sitting down there on the railroad track. Instead of going to class, 15, 16, 17-year-olds, some stupid garbage. And here I was, and I never could figure out why I ever did it. Just ignorance. Young, stupid. I saw his sister not too long ago. I asked her how he's doing. Oh, he's dead. He's been dead a long time. Been gone for a long time. Been gone a long time. See the difference? The grace of God came to me. 
The grace of God rescued me. The grace of God saved my soul. Apparently he never got any grace. Isn't that a shame? Kids are so vulnerable. They're so vulnerable. Be careful. You see your kid come up with a new friend, make sure you know who that friend is. Check their family out. Check them out. It's a big deal. You work your fingers to the bone to put them in school, buy clothes for them, do this and do that, and yet a lot of, I don't understand some parents, they don't pay any attention at all to who the friends of their kids are. And that's the biggest, that's the most important thing in your child's life. Amen. 1966, I said I do. My wife said I do. We knew each other two whole weeks. Would I recommend that? No. <laughs> no. As Putin would say, yet. <laughs> no. No. But what happened? We met the grace of God for one thing. And I came from a broken home, number two. I didn't know anything about a mother and a father. Had no clue what that meant. And I wanted a home. And by the grace of God, God gave me a home because He saved my soul when I needed to be saved. Amen. And so we've been married 47 years. 47 years. That's a long time. Amen. Amen. She's long suffering. <laughs> she is long suffering to put up with this old boy for 47 years. Hallelujah to God. God gave me a good wife. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd use what I've said tonight for the glory of God. I love you, and I bless you, and I praise you, and I exalt you. You're the Lord. You're my God. You're why I live. You put breath in my body. You raised me up. You've raised me up more than once. You've come to me more than one time. And Holy One, tonight I bless you and praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. For Jesus' sake I ask it. And amen. God bless you, folks. See you Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, Sunday.